And so she's going to chat with us a little bit about the current moment in, in the United States and what it means for civil and human rights. And so without further ado, I present Julie Fernandez, Advocacy Director for Voting Rights and Democracy at Open Society Foundation. Julie, come on up. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good Sunday, everybody. Um, what an introduction, Paul. Um, so I just hope it's not terrible, guys. I hope I can really deliver on uh, being so great. Um, but I'll say that I'm really happy to be here and happy that Paul asked me to be here and to talk with you all from the Low-Income low income Housing, um, co National Low-Income Housing Coalition because the work that you do is so, it's always been important, but now in this moment, it is at a heightened level of importance because of where we are as a country, because where we are as a community, because where we are as a movement, um, it is uh, more important than ever. So I am going to try to reflect a little bit for a few minutes, and I'll click to see what time it is so I don't run over, um, about where I think we are, and then hopefully we'll have a lot of time to ask so we can have uh, questions and dialogue about it. So, uh, and I'm talking about where we are really as a progressive community, as a community of people who are fighting for those um, people who need help fighting with them to try and make a fair, more just, more equitable country, a country where everybody has dignity. Folks in our country, understand the moment we do have to look back just for a bit, to figure out where we, just to refresh. So we all know where the country started, right? With hypocrisy. We laugh, but it's just so true, and it's, we have to re remember that we can't, many of us haven't forgotten the hypocrisy that was the founding of our country. We love our country, but that's where it was. Because slavery was the hypocrisy, the big one. The notion that we were, my, I have an 11 year old son, he said to me the other day, Mommy, I just still don't get it. I don't get how the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal, but they just weren't. Right? So, um, but we've come a long way from then. We had the hypocrisy, and we've been trying to kind of deal with it, sometimes yes, sometimes no, since then. We had all these beautiful ideals, but without the courage to kind of make them real. We have ideals that don't mean anything unless you put them into action, but we're kind of afraid of the action because the real equality is kind of threatening to folks who have power. But even saying all that, uh, 250 years ago, who could have imagined that the Supreme Court of the United States would say that black children have the same right to education as white children? Nobody would have thought they would have said that. That's got to be progress. Who could have imagined the Supreme Court saying that people have a, might, a right to marry who they love. Who would have thought that? Come on, nobody, right? Nobody would have thought that. Who would have thought Barack Obama? Okay, I didn't believe that in 2007, <laughs> right? So who was going to believe that um, 200 years ago, 100 years ago? I mean, I literally thought it just was impossible. Um, so we have all this progress, but then, then we look at the progress and then we look again and we say, how segregated are our neighborhoods? You guys know. How segregated are our schools? Are the segregated, are the black schools as good as the white schools? In the main, is education equal? Opportunity, how are we doing with that? How are we doing with the prison industrial complex? How's that going? Pretty bad. Where's the economic power in this country right now? Are oh, those five people, right? <laughs> that's where it is. That's where it is. That's not what, that's not where we want to be. Do all of our workers in this country have dignity? Do we have dignity in work? Do we have the right to collectively bargain that's protected by the courts? Do we have power for most of us? Do we have 37% of prison inmates being African American? Yeah, we do. Do we have the biggest mental hospital in every state is the prison? The prison, biggest mental hospital in every state. So while we've evolved, pro progress is not linear. I'm not telling you something you all don't know. 
Two step forward, one step back. Two step forward, one step back. And the step back, the steps back always feel terrible because you feel like you're riding high and then you feel like you just get sucker punched. 2016 election, I have to say sucker punch. I'll speak for myself. Sucker punch. I, j I think I just felt terrible. Just terrible. <laughs> And I didn't feel terrible because I didn't feel like we were making progress. I didn't think, oh, well, this is the end of the world. We're not making progress. I felt terrible because I didn't see it coming. And I really felt like um, this is a real thing. And this is a real inflection point. And we have to deal with this. So it's not because I'm hopeless. I'm very optimistic. I'm a very hopeful person. But I felt terrible because I felt like, oh, man. I didn't see this. That was a mistake. Let's figure this out. Let's do it. So we're at an inflection point. I like to say I think there are 17 reasons why Donald Trump won the presidential election. Five of them were Jim Comey. <laughs> but, but I think that we're not doing ourselves a favor if we focus too much on the tactical errors that happened in presiden the presidential campaign. And you've, heard, you've all heard it. I mean, I've been to like 17,000 different webinars all about the tactical errors of the 2016 campaign. Well, if only this, if only this, if only this little nudge this way, and we, no, you know what? We're not helping ourselves to do that. Because we have to take a minute and look at the national political trends. Take a step back and look like, what have been those warning signs we've been ignoring for a long time? in terms of where we are in the reckoning. Let's understand that so we can know how we're going to move forward. So for a while, so I was working in Washington. I spent a lot of time as an advocate to, to Congress. I'm watching politics all the time. And I've been trying to try to pass bills in Congress, you know, whatever. And, um, and so I've been watching in politics the past couple of years, and I was like, oh, the Republican Party, they are having a meltdown. They are having a internecine war and they're going to like figure out who's going to win, and then we'll see where they are, and then we'll figure out how we work with them. So what I wasn't paying attention to was the internecine war in the Democratic Party. Because that's what sort of showed, showed itself in the election. It's not, I mean, the, we can still, I mean, the, the conservatives and the Tea Party Republicans are still fighting with each other. We watch that every day. But what I think a lot of us weren't watching was what was happening on the other side of the aisle. And I, and I just say this as an observer, not as a member. I mean, I'm a member of one of the political parties, but I'm not a political activist, but just watching it happen. I read this article uh, a little while ago, and it was just seemed so perfect for the moment. It was written before the election, but it was talking about um, Gary Hart and Bill Clinton. You know, Gary Hart was the national political director for George McGovern in 72. Bill Clinton ran Texas for George McGovern in 72. So it was kind of like this moment where um, these two people who later became these you know, presidential candidates, one a president, were kind of working in the same movement. And what was interesting about the article was it talked about how there was a brand of the Democratic Party that really emerged during that time, the Gary Hart, Bill Clinton brand, which is the opportunity brand. Now, I don't want to get too, I won't give too much into it, but it's the opportunity brand. What does that mean? That the goal is to give everybody an opportunity. People should have an opportunity to go to college. People should have an opportunity to, um, to do whatever they want to do, be an opportunity to be an entrepreneur, to run your own business, to go to Silicon Valley, an opportunity to be rich. And you could see for them, I have to say for both of them, they both came from very poor, very poor, difficult circumstances, and both became like road scholars, you know? So that's a narrative, that's an approach. But what's the other approach? The other approach is the approach that was left behind is what I call the dignity approach. Not everybody is gonna go to college, not everybody wants to go to college. Not everybody is gonna be an entrepreneur, they wanna be an entrepreneur. Not everybody's going to Silicon Valley, not everybody's gonna be rich, friends. And is that the goal? Or is the goal for people to work and live in dignity? To have health insurance, to have a safe neighborhood, to have their kids want to do something, give them an opportunity to do it. Give them the back, but they should be able to, we should be able to work in any job and have dignity and health insurance, in my opinion, and safety. 
and maybe go to Disney World every couple of years, maybe go on vacation, have barbecues with your church. Like, isn't that what people are really wanting? And not to be Silicon Valley entrepreneurs or Rhodes Scholars or all go to four-year colleges. We're not all trying to get to Yale. But if you build the system where everybody has a chance to go to Yale and being rich and going to Yale is what success looks like, everybody else is not successful. All of a sudden, you're not successful. If you have a job and you work hard and you, you know, take care of your family and you go to Disney World, all of a sudden, you suck, right? So there is something to this idea about what are we actually fighting for? Are we fighting for Yale or are we fighting for Disney World? So um, we, that's the thing that I think the Democratic Party is reckoning with, and one that has a lot of implications for those of us who are fighting for equality and justice. It's not to demonize, it's to kind of lift all of us up and to say that all of us have this um, dignity. So the election, so the election was really in part, all these divisions were deeply exploited during the 2016 election, of course. And a lot of the same old themes came up, the theme around states' rights. What's states' rights about? Is it really states' rights? Now we all know the states' rights stuff came from a lot of it, you know, during the time of slavery, it was all about states' rights. If you look back at the debates around states' rights from now, from the height of the civil rights era and slavery, it's the same. It's actually the same. It's, it's not funny, it's kind of funny. Um, but this whole idea, leave states alone, let's make their own decisions, the federal government telling them what to do. What states' rights is really about is not having protections for vulnerable people, not protecting individual rights. Against what, against whom? Is it really just about the states? States' rights are corporate rights. That's one of my messages. States' rights are corporate rights, why? So all these regulations that they want to get rid of in the name of states' rights, what kind of regulations are they? All the Steve Bannon kill the administrative state. You know what that's about? That's about we don't have to regulate polluters. That's about we don't have to tell corporations how they have to run their businesses so they can do whatever they want. States' rights and corporate rights are the same. It's the same. So this whole states' rights thing, yes, it's in part about telling states they can do whatever they want unless they want to do progressive stuff. That's that footnote they don't always talk about. But states' rights is let them do whatever they want, but it's also letting corporations do whatever they want. And what's been a uh, thing in our politics for a while is that we have allowed, the, we have allowed conservatives to caption this notion of liberty. What is liberty? What is it? Is liberty freedom? So if I, if I, if there are no rules, if there are no rules, am I free? If there are no rules? No. <laughs> because who is making, there are rules, right? <laughs> rules are being made. Who's making them? I know who's making them. GM is making them. Monsanto, DuPont, that's who's making them. They're being made. It's just a question of, I know I'm not making them. The only way I get to make rules is with government. It's the only way. How am I protected against, um, how are workers protected against having corporate, corporates, corporations do whatever they want? It's rules. Where do those rules come from? Who protects them? It's government. And I'm not saying like government's the answer to everything, but my goodness, it's certainly the answer of leveling power. Because I don't have power as an individual, we don't have individual power. Corporations have power, and they have money. So the only way I get power is if government tells corporations they have to be more fair. That's just, that's just true. So the whole idea about um, liberty, what does it mean? I want liberty, I'm all for liberty. Liberty is like my middle name. I'm really a freedom type of person. Okay, I'm really into it. But I know I can't get it if I rely on other people to give it to me. They're not giving it to me. We know that from our history. We know it from our history. So all the stuff that I've been talking about around economic freedom and all that, it all circles right back to the beginning. It all circles right back to the civil rights struggle in our country. Because, so, we're just talking about liberty, what liberty means to me. What was slavery? The economic system, right? They had to invent race and racism in order to have a, have a predicate to have work without pay. 
How else can you have work without pay unless the people who you're making work without pay don't count as people? Right? So you invent race, you invent racism so that you can have um, slavery, so you can have free labor. It's an economic system. It's worked for a long time. Right. Jim Crow, economic system. Right? Can't have certain jobs, can't buy certain property, can't um, be educated. Right? What is that? Those are systems and rules to subjugate a group of people to keep them out of competition in the workforce. That's an economic system. It's about exploitation. Who gets to exploit whom? That's what Jim Crow was. There was a uh, program that the government used to run called the Bracero Program. What was that about? That was about a deal with the Mexican government to have certain Mexicans come to this country to work under exploitive conditions, wage theft, and then send them back. That's an economic system. We were into that for a while. And then when there were too many, uh, too many Mexicans in the country who weren't going back, they had something they actually called like the wet back return program. Google it. Yes. Google it. Yeah. That's the name of the program. It wasn't like it was some kind of like, I'm just calling it that in some you know, way. Even our current immigration system and all these fights about immigration right now, there are 11 million people in this country that don't have worker protections. That's what we really have. That's what the group of undocumented folks are. They're folks who are not protected by our labor laws. They're not. You complain about OSHA conditions in your workplace, you're deported. You, wanna, you complain about union busting in your plant, you're deported. Right? It's about give, having people who don't have voice and keeping them here without voice. We need to keep them here with voice, right? So our economic system has been about exploitation and race has been used, race, ethnicity, used as a way to further that exploitation. I'll say something else about this, which you all probably know, but it's good to just remind ourselves about what Martin Luther King was doing in Memphis on April 4th, 1968. What was he doing? What was he doing? It was a garbage strike, right? <laughs> he was there to get dignity for workers. That's why he was there. Because it's all the same thing, folks. We're all in this together. And it's those who experience differences and think that what we have most in common is not that. That that is what it is. Where's our dignity? Where's our economic right? That's what we have in common. 98% of us are working for somebody. <laughs> Right? That's our challenge. So, um, what are we going to do now? I mean, one thing that's really good is that um, while we had a terrible setback at the national level, which has huge implications, I mean, right now we're in a big fight, and I'm involved in a huge fight right now on Capitol Hill to try and stop Neil Gorsuch from going to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. <laughs> big fight right now. Neil Gorsuch is bad for working people. He's bad for everybody in this room, right? I mean, every time where there are floors in the law, he creates ceilings for workers, for people with disabilities, for women. Where there are floors, he creates ceilings. Where there's a chance, where there's an opportunity to sort of, and the thing of it is, you know, it's so funny. I don't know if any of you watched the hearings. It was so painful because it's all like a right? It's all. You know, they sit up there and say, oh, you know, I'm just going to just, chief, I'm just here to like, you know, I'm a judge. I'm just here to sort of, here's the law, and I'm just here to tell you what it is. As if there's some big capital T truth out there about what the, how you interpret these statutes. There's no capital T truth, friends. There's ideology. There's ideology. We all have ideology. I went to law school. I've been a lawyer for 25 years. I know I have ideology. I have a way I understand the Constitution, what I think it means. There's a range, there's an ideology that you bring to how you interpret the document. Any of you who may have studied like the Bible or the Talmud, the Torah, what are you doing? We're not actually saying, well, here's what the guy said, you know, 3,000 years ago about, no, we're saying what's the point here? What's the value? What's the ideal? And then how do we translate that to today? It's what everybody does. Anyone who's ever studied any ancient text, that's what you do. Oh, but not, not the Constitution. No, no. We have to look in there and say, did they think it was okay? in 1789. Who does that? 
anyone. But so it says that there's a dishonesty to it when he sits up there and says, I'm a judge. I just say, I just judge it. Baby, come on. We know what's going on. Reveal your ideology. Why doesn't he reveal his ideology? Because it would scare the bejesus out of a lot of us. That's why. Right? Why are they trying to rush the vote before the uh, recess? Because they don't want to go home and face us. So what do we do now? This is kind of a, a tough time. What's so great, I was sitting here, I had written things about sort of how do you, how do I want to communicate what I think is the imperative around communities, um, uh, forming coalitions in your community, figuring out who you're in, in, um, in uh, have a shared set of goals with. Being, and so I sit, I'm sitting here in the back, and Paul hands me this. Look at this. A new administration in Congress and a renewed movement for change. I look through this. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. Please pick this up out of your packet. This is fantastic. Talks a lot about things you need to do in your community, that we have power, I guess is my big message at the end of the day, is that we have been on a march to progress, but politics and community is our way out. Why has it been the biggest fight that I've been in the last several years is around, because I do this work around voting and democracy. I hate that picture so much. <laughs> around voting and democracy. I think it looks so mean, you know? I'm not that mean. Around voting and democracy. And also I look tired. Um, uh, and this fight is so big. Why is the voting rights fight so big? In 1993, 1993, Congress passed the National Voter Registration Act, the NVRA. Uh, often known as motor voter. What was that all about? It was about making it easier to register to vote. So the NVRA has two big parts to it. One, which I'm sure you're all familiar with here, is that you can register to vote in your DMV, in the Department of Motor Vehicles, Section 5 of the NVRA. The other part of it, though, at the time they said in Congress, you know, a lot of folks don't drive. Who doesn't drive? Poor people, old people, people with disabilities. So we can't have them not be covered so we also have requirements on social service agencies to provide uh, opportunities to vote. So at all the social service agencies, welfare offices, disabilities offices, they all have to not just give you, not just have the paper around, but they have an affirmative obligation to offer voter registration, and then when you do it, to send it in, right? This bill was wildly controversial in Congress. This bill, George Herbert Walker Bush vetoed this bill in 1992, I think, vetoed it. Why? The whole point of the bill was to get more people to be registered to vote and have a government system do it, so it's secure, not just folks out there, you know, doing it for money, but like the government doing it. A secure system, they could audit it. Why not? Big fight around the social service agencies registering to vote, huge. Why is that? It's going to get to the minorities and to poor people, right? The first bill that Bill Clinton signed into law was the NVRA. That bill, it was in 1993, that bill had, I mean, I have to say, this has always been a political issue, had six Republicans in the Senate vote for that bill. Six. And there were folks like Arlen Specter and Bob Packwood who would not be Republicans today. And I'm not saying that because I hate Republicans, I do not. But I think there's been a loss of commitment to what's important for our country. That's what I'm concerned about. So vote, so everyone knows, so part of the message is, is activism, but it's also because we know that the vote, the, the ballot is something you have, that we all have. If there's one thing that I have that's exactly the same as what, you know, Steve Bannon has, <laughs> one thing, just one, <laughs> is that we each have one vote. We each have one. We really do. And there's all problems with money, and there's problems with money in politics. We talk about that for a whole day. There are problems with gerrymandering. There's problems with voter suppression. I live this stuff. I do this every day, all day. But what's real is that I have one vote, and I'd better use that and get all my friends to use it and use it in the county races and use it in the city races and use it in the school board races and use it in every race I can find because that's the actual power we have to have our government be ours. That's what it is. So my, my, what I'll leave you with is this and that. Thank you very much.
go, go for it. Go for it. Sir, if I can. Yes, right here. Absolutely. There's a ton of amount, there's a ton of work being done, um, some of which I'm involved in, some of which I just know about, both around the census, but which is that the next census will then mean that all these places that draw lines for voting have to draw new lines. But there's also just a lot of work being done now to support um, uh, progressive coalitions in states to engage in the 2017, 2018 elections. There are elections in 2017, governorships that are very important, other races. 2018 is the big thing though. And, th and lines aren't gonna, I mean, the lines will be the same for 18 as they are now. The issue there is really having coalitions in states strong enough to engage their voters to, to participate in the election. 2018 is going to be a big deal at the state level and the um, congressional level. And I think your point is, and I've just, I, your point is also that in 18, you can determine state houses and then state houses draw lines in 20. So 18 is the game. 18 is the game for progressives. We either do it or we don't. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, Julie. It's Hello. Dara Baldwin. So yeah. I'm your friend. You need to know I have to ask you two questions. Okay. One is, can you talk about the EAC? Yeah. Which is important, the Election um, Assistant Commission. I think people need to know what that is because it is in jeopardy of being gone. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for always mentioning people with disabilities. And also, can you talk about the country going towards more than two parties? Mm -hmm. I think many people are there and it is a time, I'm from Jersey, so we've always had Green Party, Purple Party, <laughs> you know. And I think it's time that people start talking about more than one party and what you think that means towards election and voting and how the DNC and the RNC will address that. Okay, so I don't, so I'll start with the EAC. So the Election Assistance Commission was created in the, in the wake of the 2000 election. Anybody remember the 2000 election? Yeah, I think we do. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do. And the uh, 2000 election was, it was really what I always think is funny about the 2000 election is that it was really a time, I've been doing voting rights for a really long time, and it was a time when sort of the whole country realized how decentralized and how messy elections are. Those of us who do elections know that, right? It's sort of volunteers with shoeboxes trying to figure out, you know, who should be voting. It's a very, very, any system like that has its virtue, but it also has its messiness. And because the presidential election was decided by fewer than 600 votes in a very, um, with lots of stuff going on, uh, people decided that that was an area where they could win or lose big through systems how election systems work. And it actually started a lot of the politicization of election systems, the 2000 election. But part of that was this bill called the Help America Vote Act that Congress passed in 2002. And that bill created the Election Assistance Commission, which was this entity that was supposed to provide technical assistance to states, also set standards for voting machines and voting technology, and to essentially be a resource and a clearinghouse for best practices for states to improve their elections. So of course, there's a huge bunch of folks in Congress who hate it. Because they don't want best practices going to states about elections. And they don't want money going to states to help them improve their election systems. I, I, I frankly do not understand this unless it's just a wholesale, a wholesale move to want to destroy things that aren't in service to them. I, don't, I really genuinely don't understand. I mean, it's literally best practices. It's literally like, here's a booklet on how you can improve your early voting system. So there is a bill in Congress, I think it passed the House actually. It didn't? It, pa it got out of committee, it's gonna, it will go to the House floor to eliminate the Election Assistance Commission. I don't understand it. On the, on the multiple parties part, I don't really know that much about it. I do know that over time, one of, one of the things that has happened in our political system over time is that the political parties have become less important and that's kind of, I think, been bad for our democracy. Because the more, the political parties used to be where everybody sent their money and the parties kind of served as a mediating force against some madness. Increasingly, people send their money through, their money is dark and it's just going to sort of uh, PACs and super PACs and other entities, issue groups, 
that are kind of really influencing elections and there's no way to know what's going on with that money and that influence and the parties have no power to, um, to sort of serve as a more transparent mediating force. So I, I, I think I'm, I'm not an, I think that countries that have sort of parliamentary systems and multiple parties, they end up with, uh, they end up, it's not an ideal system. It's a system that in fact, in some ways is, um, is even more problematic from a progressive perspective. But I mean, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert, but I do know the death of parties, the way our system is now, has been bad for us, in my opinion. Anybody else? No, I have to hold on to it. Oh, her okay, call. right. Yeah, I was trying to take the <laughs> microphone away from her. She won't give it to me. Um, one of the things that you mentioned on on Chris Hayes' show uh, that I thought was really interesting is, and and you mentioned fair housing, I believe, in the list of things that uh, you said we need to be watching for, and that is not only what they do, but what they don't do. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, that's a big so. A lot of time as other, with others to try to um, monitor what is happening in this new administration. Because obviously, you don't just when you elect a president, you don't elect a president, you elect an entire government, as you all know well. So you elect a whole infrastructure that's going to be running all kinds of things, including the enforcement of civil rights laws and fair housing laws and all kinds of laws that are trying to help make the country more equitable. And so the concern is not just with. Um, like for example, in fair housing with HUD, it's not just that they won't be bringing cases that will have a big, a big uh, make a difference in the fair housing community. It's also that they're not going to be um, doing anything. So you had this affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation that HUD did two years ago, I think. That was kind of a big deal. The Fair Housing Act has always had this obligation to affirmatively further fair housing, but there was never any kind of content to that. And so they went through this huge process and put obligations about what that means. So who's going to enforce that now? Who's going to make that real? So there's the threat of unwinding it, but they don't even have to unwind it. They can just not do it. There's some statutes that uh, the federal government has a big role in enforcing, like the Voting Rights Act, that I just think they won't do at all, just at all and just say it's within their discretion not to do it. But what they'll also do is there's a part of the National Voter Registration Act that is a list maintenance provision. So it puts some obligations on states, but also rules about how they have to maintain their voting rolls. And the last time that um, uh, I'll say when George W. Bush was the president, they used that tool to try and force states to do unlawful purges, to throw folks off the rolls unlawfully, saying it was about list maintenance. And it was really about shrinking the voter rolls. And guess who was targeted for that? Don't guess. You know. <laughs> so there are, there's a lot of stuff they won't do. They won't enforce laws. They won't um, um, pursue um, application of different regulatory regimes. I mean, all the stuff, th it's kind of funny, you know, back in the Reagan days, there were private people, su they were suing the federal government to force them to enforce, like, the environmental laws. You got to do it. It's the law. You know? And the Supreme Court says, no, they don't. No, they don't. Oh, thank, you. thank you. No, I got to hold it. Oh, you've got to hold it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you've referred to regulation. Do you have anything to say about what's happening with uh, the getting rid of so many regulations through the CRA yeah. and what that is going to mean to all of us? not the expert on this to be able to know the details about various regs to than others. I know that. So there are certain, if, if they've actually, if to create the regulation, they went through this and comment process, and so they issued like a, uh, a notice, they took a comment period, and they issued a final rule, and then there's some cooling off period, I don't know how much time it is, and a certain number of days have elapsed, I don't know if it's 60 days or 90 days. That rule is really hard to undo. It takes a much, it takes another big process to undo it. They'd have to issue a new notice. They'd have to be a new uh, comments coming in. You have to address all the comments in writing. It takes a long time. It's a threat. It's real. It takes a long time. The thing that's most dangerous is that President Obama did a lot of stuff by executive order. 
Executive orders are just like, because he's the head of the federal government, he runs all the agencies, the president, the agency, you just kind of say, I want you to do it all within their discretion of enforcing the law. But that can be undone instantly. And some things that we think of as regulations actually aren't. They're actually executive orders. There's this whole um, executive order that's all about, um, all about affirmative action and federal contracting. That's an executive order. It's not a reg. It's been an executive order since the 70s, but it's an executive order, not a reg. But Obama did a lot, particularly I think in the environmental area, but also uh, one issue that I worked on is this FCC net neutrality. That was sort of an opinion by the FCC about whether or not the uh, internet service providers should be treated like public utilities in order so they could be regulated to ensure they're not um, treating different uh, content differently or charging people more or less for different speeds or whatever. That they can just change. So it's a, it's a huge threat. Though for some, I'll say, for some that's an actual rule, it's hard to undo an action. They can do it, but it's harder. It takes a long time. They can still do it. Did you have something else? They haven't. They haven't. What they've done already has to do with the executive orders, because they, they couldn't have changed rules by, if it's an actual rule that went through notice and comment, they couldn't have changed it already. It's too, it's too little time. It's too little time. They must, be, they must be executive orders or policies, things that aren't actual rules under the um, APA, the Administrative Procedure Act. Yes? Part of what they're doing says that once they have done this, then an agency cannot create a new rule at all similar to it in perpetuity. Well, they can't do it in perpetuity, right? Because then if the new president were to come in, then they could just say that in perpetuity is over. I mean, it's funny. President Trump thinks he has a lot more power than he does. I'll just say that. He really seems to not kind of understand that there are three branches of government, there are like, you know, rules, we have systems, we have a whole, it's a whole big, you know, what's funny is that his corporation that he runs, his business, whatever, you know it's a private corporation, right? It's not even a publicly traded corporation. There aren't, so he, he lives in a world of no rules at all, and always has. And now he's the head of like the most rule-laden, most sort of litigated entity in the world. That's why he's so mad about all the Muslim ban stuff and the courts. It's like he's stamping his feet. What do you mean I can't do what I want? It's like, well, no, you can't, man. Like, we do have rules. We still have courts. So, um, so yeah, he thinks he has a lot more power than he does to just do stuff. And it's our job to hold it, to, to use the courts and the court of public opinion and everything else, but the courts in particular, to remind him and what's left of Congress. We'll see. 2018. Uh, What's left of Congress, yeah, 2018, to have some accountability, to remind him that there are laws, you know, and rules. Anybody else? Somebody else? Yes. Uh, I was uh, going to your comment that you were curious whether you fight uh, voter suppression efforts. Yeah. So state or local things to fight voter suppression efforts. So there, is there, there actually is a lot going on. I mean, I think that... Um, so there are two different things to, or several things, but two kind of phases to worry about. One is, well, there maybe there are three different areas. One is work to combat existing voter suppression laws, so through litigations. There are a number of groups that are litigating against things like um, onerous voter ID laws or cutbacks in, um, in early voting, where early voting has been a tool to help equalize um, opportunities for voting. So there's sort of a litigation track. But then there's also this track of just sort of having folks show up at boards of elections to know what the heck is going on and to use that power to sort of to say, to use that information as power in their community. Because a lot of what happens at the, at the county level, which is where a lot of these rules are made, and some at the state level, but some at the county level, is a lot of decisions being made about access to the ballot, about voting days and times and polling place locations, and no one knows about it. 
and they think their obligation is made through their putting something in the local paper saying this is what we're doing. And that actually is a form of voter suppression because it's a form of lack of transparency and knowledge. Until 2013, there was a part of the Voting Rights Act, Section 5 of the Act, that required all or part of 16 states to get federal pre-approval for any voting changes. So the whole South basically was covered by this obligation to ensure that any of their voting changes went through a federal anti-discrimination check before it could be implemented. And it was hugely powerful. And it was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2013. I don't even want to talk about it. I could talk about that forever. But it was, a, it was a crazy decision that was ungrounded in law and was grounded only in power. I mean, if uh, the lawyers out there read it, it's nonsensical. It's all about power. But the result of that is that a lot of the vote, voter suppression shenanigans that used to happen only in the North, so our big battlegrounds were like Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois. It's now Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, because now there's no anti-discrimination check. So a lot of this voter suppression stuff, it's, not, it's directed op often at racial minorities as proxies for Democrats, frankly. Sometimes it's, it's directed at racial um, and ethnic minorities because those community, the people in power want those communities to be on the outs. Those two things are kind of similar in some ways. But, um, but the fight is really about knowing what happens. And when we had Section 5 in the South, I guess my point was going to be we knew everything that was happening all the time because they had to tell the federal government everything. Now they have to tell us nothing or tell them, it used to be them, tell them nothing. So information is very powerful because things that folks would do under cover of night, they won't do if it's in the paper. So that's the thing people can do. They can sort of become active about knowing what's happening, publicizing it, showing up at meetings. It's tough work. People have jobs. You know, how do you show up at the boards of elections all the time when you've got stuff to do? You know, your kid has a recital or whatever. So, but that, that is part of the power. And it is also still trying to have an affirmative vision about what the right to vote means and what your state and your county should do about it. Why is we have, so we have all kinds of rights, you know, we have the right to bear arms, right? Right to, what the Supreme Court has said, right to own any firearm I want, including, you know, I don't know, semi-automatic weapons. So I have that right, and anytime any state wants to do anything to infringe my right to bear arms, it is just like they have to go through the ringer to be able to infringe on my right to bear arms, right? It's like, well, you can't do this, no, you can't do that. Any little infringement on my right to bear arms is like a big deal and the court treats it like a huge deal, right? What about my right to vote? How's that doing? Is that the same? Do I have the same right to vote? Is it the same level as the right to bear arms? The answer is just no, my friends. It's just not. States do all kinds of stuff. Registering to vote, way ahead of time. What if your last name, my last name ends in an S? Typically, it ends in a Z. If they had a Z in that book and I'm an S, I'd have to go down to the DMV and get a different ID. I have friends who have names that they use on their papers that are different. I, that, that takes away my right to vote. If I show up in some states without my ID, I was born in America, been voting since I was 18, whatever, I haven't moved in seven years, I show up without my ID in some states and I could just be denied the right to vote, bam. I'm not a citizen who has a voice because I left my purse at home. And maybe sometimes the polling place is a half an hour drive from my house and I have to get to work. And maybe sometimes my ID, I lost it two years ago and I don't drive. Or maybe, you know, there are all kinds of reasons that people don't have, don't show up with their ID. Why does that mean I don't have a right to vote? So we have, a, we have, to, have, a, we have to have an affirmative vision for what the right to vote means and how it should be protected. And it should be protected so that if you want to mess with it, you better have a darn good reason and show me exactly why you get to mess with my right to vote. But we don't have that. We need to have that. OK, four minutes. Yeah, I'm going to go over here because you already had a question. I'm <laughs> sorry, over here? Yes, ma'am. By you opened by talking about something that I think I personally feel a big responsibility for. I, I never expected this country as a whole to demonstrate such racism, such hatred, such violence, such anger mm -hmm. as would be necessary to elect him president. Mm -hmm. 
And I feel as a Democrat that I somehow totally missed everything that was going around me in the world. And I've been a social worker for 25 years and always worked with people who are oppressed and under-resourced and discriminated against. What do we, as members of the Democratic Party, need to do? Because we blew it last time. And I don't want that to happen again. We blindly thought that we had it done. Yep. And, and we didn't. And, we didn't. and I, I can't find anybody who can tell me what we needed to be doing for those four years that somehow we were totally oblivious to before, the, you know, before he came on the scene. And I, and I, I've, I've sworn that I'll never say his name yeah, loud. Yeah, I so. that. <laughs> Sorry about that, but you know. It's so funny. He who must not, not be named. Yeah. But what do we need to do? Because we blew it. We screwed up. Okay, so that's so funny because you know Thank you're you. not alone in that not saying his name, right? <laughs> you know, it's so challenging, isn't it? It's so challenging. So. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are wrestling with that question because I, I do think, and I, as I said, I've been to a lot of, you know, polling, research, blah, 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 blah. I think there are a lot of reasons why um, he won the election. I think there are a lot of reasons for it. But, but part of it, but yeah, there, well, like I said, five of them are Jim Comey. But I think that there are, I think that packed within that is this, fact that many of us did not understand the level of racism and misogyny that exists out there in the country. We just didn't see it because we're not living it. And we're not in it, you know, because we do live, I mean, and I'm, I'm in it too, right? I'm a East Coast liberal, right, <laughs> that reads the New Yorker and the New York Times and my Twitter feed are all these lefties and whatever. And that's kind of what I think the world is. And we do sometimes, I'll live say this, some of us, huh? We live in a bubble. Yes, and we live in a bubble that is a bubble that's sometimes a little bit smug. Just to say, our bubble can be a little bit smug, can be a little bit, th that a little bit, you know, they're so stupid. Right? And that does not help us get where we need to go. Because I do think that there are a number of people, and we can, you know, think about what we want, but we have to be able to say, we have something in common with a lot of these folks. There's some hardcore racists, whatever. I'm never going to have anything in common with them. The hardcore racists that exist that voted for he who shall not be named, I'm never going to reach them. It's just, it's not, I'm not, not going to get there. But I don't think that's what makes the difference here. Now, remember, I mean, I, I know this is what we all, I tell myself this all the time just to keep myself going. Just to say, should not be named. He did win by 77,000 votes in three states. Okay? Hillary Clinton did win three million more votes nationwide. And people say, well, a lot of that's in California. Does California not count? Are they not citizens? <laughs> Why does all of a sudden California and New York don't count? Neither does what? Maryland doesn't count either? Why not? Because whatever. By the way, we, we, I think we all count. But the point is, is that there are a bunch of folks that didn't feel like they were being heard. And I do think it was black and white and Latino. I don't think it was just white. Working folk, folks who saw all this Goldman Sachs elitism. I mean, and just to say it out loud again, I mean, this is not a political moment, but I'll just say it out loud. Like, what was Hillary Clinton doing with Goldman Sachs making millions of dollars off speeches? I mean, just to say it out loud. It's like, so what, what was that? Why, why were Democrats so captured by that? Not what we That people felt that, and they were like, I don't feel like she gets me. Now, of course, again, I get the racism, I get the Obama backlash, I get the misogyny. How could a woman possibly be, you know, she's so shrill. Why is she shrill? He is the most shrill. Shrill? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> right? So it's totally unfair. I get all of that. But we have to own some of that if we're going to get to a better America. And we have to get to the place where we say, what are we really about? And hold our elected officials up to that. And say, no, no, no. You can think, you're gonna, you persuaded me for a long time. I just had to like wait a little bit. 
It's not okay. It's not okay for all those. It's not okay for all those kids in prison either. It's not okay for them. And it's not okay for all these for, for working class people who have lost their right to collectively bargain and to have dignity in their work. It's not okay for them. This should not be the Goldman Sachs economy. And so maybe when I'm feeling in a positive mood, I think this is the reckoning that we needed. I know it feels bad. I hope he doesn't start a nuclear war. But I think that we may have needed this in order to wake us up to what we need to do. Uh, the day after the election, I was listening, I was in the car, and I was driving to work in a daze, and uh, I heard this radio show. Of course it was NPR, whatever. I am who I am. <laughs> and um, there was a woman being interviewed in NPR. I don't know who it was. She was uh, sounded like a black woman. And the interviewer said, are you angry right now? Do you feel really angry? And she said, no, no, I'm not angry at all. I am awake. <laughs> and that's how I feel. I feel like, you know what, we're awake, people. Let's remember what we are. <laughs> don't live where we live and don't whatever, do what we do. Because we have a lot in common with them too. It's something, you know, we do. And let's remember that. And that it is not, you know, it's, it's not this, it's, it's about understanding where we really have things in common that matter. So that's what I think. Okay, I guess that's it. I'm getting the hook. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.